the next presentation from Petr Bojanic and Gazela Puder Drashko, but we don't have Petr today. Petr is. Gazela is here. <laughs> but we are together. No, it's fine. I will explain. Good. Petr is uh, principal research fellow and director of the institute, and Gazela is a research fellow at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. So, Petr. Okay, never mind. Uh, uh, I'd like just to present the problem uh, and uh, and uh, we can say investigation, uh, which I'm sharing with uh, Gazella. Uh, problem is here in uh, in uh, rolls one passage of rolls in his uh, uh, talk about idealistic philosophy he's talking about hegel and he said that uh, exactly that civil society i quote rolls comprises three parts the system of needs the administration of justice and police and corporation. Police, polizai, is from the Greek politeia, and its meaning is much wider than our word police. In Hegel's day, this is rules, everything, in Hegel's day, it covered not only law enforcement, but also the fixing of the prices of necessities, the control of the quantity of goods, the arrangement of hospitals, street lighting, and much else. That was the police in Hegel's way, time. Hegel still rules. Hegel has considerable discussion of the problems of the civil society. He was distressed at the growth of poverty and recentful pubel, rubble. But he, he offers no answer to it. Okay. That means when I, when I, when I work on a book uh, about institution, I, I wrote, I, I imagine, one text on discipline. Uh, Roberto knows and Nuria knows what I'm talking about. And then I saw that uh, there is no institution without police. Uh, See, here you can see the first scene of institutional building and you see there is no leader between, I hope you, you remember this passage, there is no leader there, they are producing acts between them, they are alone, but, but at the end in, 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 in uh, point five you see we can say controller or policeman. Uh, that means uh, they are producing one instance which is not present or which is present in their acts. Uh, and this, okay, I will, I will account, count several uh, problems. What, what I found, uh, what this pushed me to to first write one text on Hegel, then then write again something with Gazella, and published in Italian. Then then we are still working on it, and the definitive version will be in English for Adriana's uh, and Gazella's uh, volume. Uh, uh, a problem for me is how we are. Uh, where is this? this uh, protocol of policing, uh, how we are producing it, is it violent, and uh, what we have in history, uh, how, to, how to read differently from Foucault, because I, I was not, you know, I followed many, many sources, I followed Foucault, I've, I try, I, I read this this uh, book from 1769 uh, of uh, on police, the, the Justus, 
uh, where police is um, police uh, uh, functions completely differently than than in Foucault. Uh, but I, I will not, you know, uh, uh, talk about this. Then uh, I saw. Okay, first of all, where is the problem, and then the sources. The problem is the. Uh, f first, I don't care for epistemological now problem, secret service, uh, transparency, etc., etc. I don't care for this. This is this is something other. I'm I'm I'd like to uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, first of all source of the police of the professional police is uh, protest. That means. Uh, Police is uh, institution imagined to resist to the protest, resist to the people, and in that uh, you can you can very easy find the the the, the years when uh, police s started to be professional, not not part of civil society and something which controlling circulation. We can say. That police is uh, uh, policing is uh, circulation between us, words, uh, uh, goods, and uh, that that was the position of police. Uh, then, uh, is it violent when when police is is uh, transformed in the uh, state institution with Fichte, but not just with Fichte? That's why Hegel is completely against Fichte. For Hegel, police is, is uh, uh, belongs to to civil society. For for Fichte, as you remember, to the state, you know, just for Fichte. Today is the state institution. Uh, okay, problem is over policing, uh, criminalization of the citizens. Uh, uh, and how to uh, how to uh, how to uh, recognize uh, origin of violence? Is it is it uh, policing all, always violent? And then compare the that that's is most important. I think this is the that could be one of the of the of the. Uh, uh, Task of philosopher, uh, I think today. Uh, I can. I, 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 uh, in June, I tried to talk on police uh, in context of policy, civil polity, uh, uh, because this is this is uh, when we are in 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 policing. We in public policy, we are trying to to bring that institution in civil society. That's the, that's the to, 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 to catch it to take to take it from the state. That means uh, when we are okay. This is this is still for us very important when we are in pro protocol of engagement. When I am engaged citizen, I am in public policy, and I am immediately uh, 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 still. Uh, police institution from the state. That means I am not good citizen when I when I when I see um, s uh, one uh, criminal act and ask where is the police here because we are all the time in this city on every city we are all the time searching the policeman because policeman is never here is never we are calling police etc etc police is not here this is not the job of police. This is a job of this is my job to 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 do to do to produce engagement act and also this is my this is our job to produce many engagement acts to stop some to stop criminalizing the other people uh, in the society because when I'm when I'm searching for the policeman I'm immediately criminalizing the others. Okay, this this is this is problem. This is problem. This is the beginning of problem. And uh, why? Uh, why? Uh, because in the last thirty years, 
uh, you had many, you had, we can say, uh, as a part of philosophy, uh, some kind of ethics of war. Uh, many of philosophers after, in the last 30 years, tried to, try to, 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 to mix, to, to, uh, to normal, uh, to, to, to justify what is the justify killing and not. And if philosophers have participated in the last 30 years in writing ethics codes for various armies, for example, uh, here was one guy from Israel, philosopher, who, who wrote uh, uh, who wrote ethic codes for for Israeli army. If so-called soldiering resulted in the American soldier having far less authority in the use of force from the American policeman, then it is clear that philosophers have yet another task. And this task will be if we want to, to, to imagine some kind of um, engagement citizen, then immediately we will we will, uh, uh, how to say, we will uh, uh, try to uh, renew this degraded institution, uh, which is police. Uh, well, degradation, that means Hegel, first of all, Hegel said that Fichte degraded police. Then you have, uh, then you have uh, in, uh, in uh, for example, Benjamin, he said in uh, in this critical violence piece, he said that that uh, uh, police violence or police is degraded institution because of democracy. Democracy is implies degradation of police. It's necessary to think about this. This is just well small suggestion institution uh, suggestion. Not there is no argument in this text. It's just just you know. Uh, then, uh, then, for example, if you if you if you go to the United States and if you go to a small city uh, in the United States, you will see all all the time signs where is marked. Uh, for example, I remember this: Itaka is watching community or Itaka is watching neighborhood. That means uh, I have to be as an engaged citizen of Itaka. I have to. I have to watch uh, and uh, not to go to police station and say I saw something, but to say to neighbor th th that there is some uh, problems. This is very important because you, we've, it is not marked when you see something uh, suspicious, go to, to the police station. It is said uh, Itaka is a watching community. That means uh, we are citizens and we are, uh, we are not watching each other. This is stupid. We are watching connections between us. That means policing or police is in, in this, uh, uh, how to say, source, is to watch connection, to watch, for example, if I'm saying something to control my language and if my message uh, arrives uh, on right place in a, in a, that, that that means this is policing act if you if you uh, if you are using french if you are you if you have french tastatura um, you you see you see that police is the the dimension of the letters this is police for example 12 is police, uh, which is font in English, in, in French is police. Uh, that means police is uh, a set of rules which uh, help us to, to be connected. And we are responsible for this connection. Uh, well, uh, also, I, I, I was not happy with, the, with this, for example, uh, Serlian. Uh, you can find this in, in Searle, uh, the position of police in, in society where, for example, I quote Searle from uh, Making the Social World, uh, why it is necessary to have police and various other coercive mechanisms within the system of institutions. Sometimes you have to call the police 
or use other coercive measures. But the necessity of police is not inconsistent with the power of the deontology. This is correct. The police powers presuppose the deontology rather than being inconsistent with it, because the content of the police powers must be mirrored in the deontology. Uh, that's why this is uh, this is this passage is never mind, never mind. This passage is correct, uh, deontologically uh, correct, but uh, wrong because. Uh, 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 Searle uh, doesn't know nothing about Hegel uh, and does know nothing about uh, this tradition where norms are incorporated in, in uh, how to say, which is difficult to, 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 to justify, but uh, uh, the question is who is responsible for connections uh, between us, uh, between uh, who is responsible for circulation. Then, uh, uh, I can stop here. That's it. That's it. You see. You see the problem. The last presentation for this panel is from Miller Sipernis from Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, Position of the Dish. Uh, thank you, Igor. Um, deaf history is a um, really dark paradigm how which shows how human beings have treated each other. The affirmation and more just integration of this linguistic community into society has been a very arduous process faced with, with obstacles made of some of the most critical moments in the history of Europe, both of which form an important layer of its heritage. From jurisprudence to philosophy, from theology to pseudo-pedagogy, various disciplines have dealt with the subject of persons with hearing impairment who, from a phenomenological point of view, are characterized by a unique experience of reality and the structure of the world, irreducible to that shared by the most, I quote, normal people. It is not only the sensory deficiency of this social minority which constitutes a separate and immeasurably different world. Many governing practices, customs, and even simple ignorance have further deepened and widened the gap between the two worlds. Language itself is a treasure preserving traces of the degrading attitude towards this population. The Spanish word sordo, which comes from the Latin surdus, has an equivalent in Serbian in the form of the word, word gluv. When dictionaries are consulted, it becomes apparent that these words have a negative connotation. Surdus represents that which is without expression, stupid, closed up, something unintelligible. The usage of this adjective was not con confined to hearing related phenomena only. For example, the phrase surda color was recorded in Latin. When used figuratively, this term refers to a person who is unresponsive and obstinate, a person who is characterized by their negative social acts and who, not hardly, and who can hardly be educated. The entry for the adjective sordo in Sebastián de Covarrubias famous Tesoro de la Lengua Castellano Española, published in 1611, reads, I quote, there is no worse deaf than who does not want to hear, end of quote. Traditionally, the Serbian word gluv, deaf, was used to describe traits that were not at all considered positive. As Petar Skok shows in Etymological Dictionary of Croatian or Serbian language, gluv is that which is wild and barren, but also that which is insipid. Non-singing birds were also called deaf. Skok points out that the words gluv, deaf, and gloop, stupid, share a common root. It is particularly telling that the Latin word absurdus, absurdan in Serbian, absurdo in Spanish, has the lexem surdus as its base. In the supplement to his Tesoro, 
Sebastián de Covarrubias defines the absurd as, I quote, absurd is said everything that is ugly and unworthy of being heard. In addition to referring to sounds which are un unpleasant to the ear, a dissonant tone, the absurd also refers to that which is irrational and senseless. However, today it can legitimately be said that the opposite of reason is not represented by hearing impaired, but the way they have been treated for a long time. This is clearly evident from the linguistic standpoint, that is to say, from the accumulated derogatory meanings of these attributes which the members of this social minority have shared with other living beings and inanimate creatures and objects around them. The lack of ability to speak was seen as an animalistic characteristic, which this is a commonplace uh, with a strong foothold in European philosophical tradition. This premise has also given rise to a certain zoological rhetoric directed against people with hearing impairment. Following the oral method, a comparison with the parrot has been made, a bird known for repeating sounds and mechanically reproducing words. The use of manual approach, one based primarily on body language and facial expressions, evoked the image of an ape or monkey, a symbol of slavish imitation, an animal which physically resembles a human because among other similarities, it possesses not only legs, but arms as well. Such, such mocking vocabulary, full of arrogance, bellies more than just a mere desire to joke. In particular, the figure of this primate, the, the ape, strikes as the essence of the aforementioned assumption. Logos is what separates a human being from an animal. It manifests itself through spoken words, logos. Deaf people make sounds with their mouths like beasts and other animals, but they are unarticulated cries, undifferentiated sound, matter without signified. People with prelingual deaf deafness cannot express themselves verbally, and these circumstances causes them to be degraded and animalized in the eyes of the majority who are able to speak without difficulty or additional aids. However, this metaphysical thesis has been observed as unsustainable due to being based on the reduction of the limits of communication and reason to speech. There are modes of expressions other than speech, such as gestural language and the visual arts. They use types of signifiers different from those used by verbal communication system. Equating speech with reason is simply too narrow and wrong of a view. It is important to emphasize that this prejudice has been dominant for centuries and has led to numerous attempts to forcibly repress sign language and institutionally force the deaf to renounce their mother tongue. Such an initiative culminated in the International Congress on the Education of Deaf held in Milan in, 19, in 1880. Conversation via hands, fingers, and facial, facial movements was regarded as a relic of savagery, the animality that man must transcend and free himself or herself once from all, because it is an imperative of, of his true nature. It is a perverse fact that in ancient times, deafness was seemingly held a high value within the institution of slavery. One of his, in one of his epigrams, the Roman poet, poet Martial indicates that a mule driver was sold for a price higher than average precisely because he was unable to hear. The epigram ends with the following words. Do you wonder at so heavy a price? He was deaf. Mirai spretium tan grave? This trait is something that his master had certainly had to appreciate in Roman society due to the privacy it afforded. A certain triangle-shaped hierarchy is established in these verses. The deaf slave controls a harnessed animal and the free Roman citizen controls both. After all, it is well-known fact that the slave was described as living tool 
in the ancient philo uh, political philosophy, organon and psychon. In this case, he or she is a tool that does not speak, but because uh, they are not, not because they are lifeless, but because they are prevented by nature from doing so. Adding to the fact that the deaf persons were most often denied a more comprehensive education, primarily to those born into poor families, they were extremely suitable for exploitation and cheap physical labor, a practice which would continue to be nurtured through the epochs. How the deaf were treated show two records from the 17th century. One of them, very famous, is found in the first textbook dedicated to the education of dead deaf people. It is written by, by Juan Pablo Bonet, and its title is Reduccion de las Letras y Arte para Enseñar al, al Hablar a los Mudos. In that book we read, I quote, Some have wanted to replace this fault by taking the mutes to the countryside and in valleys where the voice has greater sonority to make them give loud shouts and with such violence that they came to bleed from the mouth, putting them also in buckets where the voice reverberated loudly and they could hear it amplified. On the other place, the following cruel and humiliating method was recorded. I borrow it from the book A Silent Minority, Deaf Education in Spain. About one educator of the deaf, it is said, I quote, the truth is that he behaved toward him like a dog trainer would or those people who for money display trained animals that surprise you with their skill and obedience and, and seem to understand and explain by signs all that their master tells them. He used hunger, bastinado, it is uh, beating on the soles of the feet with a stick, deprivation of light and reward commensurate with performance. From a theological perspective, deafness has been viewed as a consequence of divine punishment or the influence of demons. A person's inability to hear meant that they could not be reached by faith. This view within the church is based on the dominant oralism of ancient cultures. A child would be born without the ability to hear because it had allegedly carried the sins of its parents or ancestors. This connection of prelingual deafness and immorality has persisted and instances of it have been recorded as recently as the 19th century. Neither the legal restrictions imposed upon the deaf nor the fight against unjust decisions in legislation should be overlooked either. In Roman law, the impact of which on the European states which followed was immeasurable, deafness was considered a physical disability, vitium corporalis. In accordance with the oral procedure from each which it ensued, persons with this impairment were not guaranteed all of their rights and were restricted in their participation in public and private life. They could not make a will because they would not be able to hear the response of the one to whom the inheritance was to be granted. In the, in the text it says, Surdus quoniam verba familiae emptor ex audire non potest. Likewise, they could not even enter a contract because in that case they would not, they would have to, head to hear the promiser's words and vice versa. Qui stipulatur verba promittentis and qui, pro, uh, and qui promitit verba stipulantix ex audire debet. The law was especially cruel towards people who were surdus or surda anatura and not ex accidente, that is, those who are congenitally deaf, born deaf. A significant step towards the improvement of their status before the court was made by a work written in 1550 by the jurist Licenciado Lasso entitled The Legal Treatise on Mutes, Tratado Legal Sobre los Mudos. Among other things, this text demands that the members of this minority be given the right to inheritance, 
that they no not be treated as idiots or as social beings if they are unable to fulfill a certain requirement. In this treatise, I quote, in which based on a new style and method of speech, it is considered and established by law that mute persons excluded from the institution of certain inheritance where the mutes are excluded would be capable of acquiring said inheritance if they became able to speak, as if they had never been mute. In these words, in order to be formally equal with other members of the community in which they live, they must learn to speak and show that they are intelligent. However, following the 16th century and early modern times, that is the epoch when attitudes to hearing people uh, towards hearing impaired person began to radically shift and improve, legal regulations directed against those who are affected would still be enacted even with, with unsurpassed aggression. By far, the most monstrous product within the domain of leg legislation would, uh, would be the law for prevention of offspring with hereditary diseases passed by the Nazis in 1933. It prescribes the enforcement of the forced sterilization of persons with hereditary deafness. At the same time, certain teachers of the deaf have also proposed and defended the creation of registers of four hereditarily diseased students with files of the families in which they, these cases were documented and catalogues of all such persons within the state. There was a plan to keep the sterilizations as confidential as possible to preserve collective silence. For example, one of the preserved letters addressed to the sterilized reads, I quote, the authorities have ordered, no one may speak about sterilization, not even you yourself. Take note, you are to tell no one about this, not even your relatives. And the doctor and the judge, they too must keep silent. Obey the authorities, obey even when it is difficult for you. Think of the future of your people and make the sacrifice that is asked of you." End of quote. Accordingly, it was in these moments that the two types of silence intertwined, that of the victim out of the shame and that of the executioner out of concern to not alarm the public. In the case of disobedience, the, the police made violent interventions and made, made use of handcuffs. Two years later, an amendment to the law was passed mandating abortion if at least one of the parents had a hearing impairment of this type. Regardless of the fact that the child of a deaf parent is not guaranteed to inherit their disability, fatal killings were still committed relentlessly. A case was documented in which a woman had remained pregnant after sterilization and so an abortion was performed followed by repeat sterilization. Such violent acts, compulsory sterilization and abortion, had terrific consequences, from death to suicide, from psychological disorders to broken engagements. The remarkable book in which these crimes were publicized is called Crying Hands, which is the name of the print created by deaf artist David Ludwig Bloch, who was taken to the Dachau concentration camp, but managed to survive. That woodcut is also featured, uh, featured on the cover of this book. Both in Spain, in Serbia, the recognition of persons with hearing impairment as distinguished members of society came about via the art of painting. However, it should be added that this artistic profession was not always appreciated elsewhere as it is today, being instead primarily viewed as a type of manual labor. In any case, there are prominent cases in which both countries have officially supported their deaf painters. As such, they worked under their patronage. The court of Madrid had the official title of the court painter, which was performed by two artists with total hearing impairment. The first was Juan Fernandez Navarrete and the second Francisco Goya. Navarrete was initiated into painting in his childhood at the monastery in Rioja. He continued his education by traveling the cities of Italy 
and then becoming an official court painter. He worked for Philip II until his death, primary within the complex of the El Escorial Royal Monastery. Goya performed the duties of the painter de Camara and completed his greatest works after completely losing his hearing. Here I, I, I would like to highlight his print, uh, Las Cifras de la Mano, which shows the letters of the one-handed sign alphabet. We can show it. I should continue uh, until it is OK. Um, uh, the most famous deaf Serbian painter is certainly Boža Ilić, the author of the iconic composition Soundic of Terrain in New Belgrade, Sondiranje Terena na Novom Beogradu, from uh, 1948. This painting represented Social Fe Federative Republic of Yugoslavia at the 25th Biennale in Venice and is preserved today at the National Museum in Belgrade. This painting of monumental uh, proportion, which we will see, depicts human figures working patiently and hard after the Second World War to build a better world and a more just city. A prominent role in the organization and education of the deaf community of our two countries was played by individuals whose vocation was related to the world of the visible, not of the audibly perceivable. The Royal School for Deaf Mutes was established in 1805 in Madrid. One of the peoples whose work marked the first decades of school existence is Roberto Prades. He studied visual arts in Valencia and the capital and was described as the first deaf professor of the deaf in Spain. On the other hand, it is pertinent to mention the fact that the idea for the establishment of the first association of hearing impaired person in Serbia was suggested by an academic painter. He is from Zagreb and his name is Ivan Smole. Thus, in February 1926, the Association of the Deaf Mutes of Belgrade and the surrounding region was formed as the first organization. In recent decades, we have witnessed various institutional acts which aim to reduce and to the extent of their power, eliminate the injustice that was long been suffered by members of this community. Belgrade is one of the few European cities with a serological museum. It was established in the middle of the 20th century and houses works by deaf artists from this region. Unfortunately, today it is in a rather poor condition. Important documents have been adopted at the level of international cooperation, such as the Salamanca Statement, the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, ratified by both Spain and Serbia, is the document which has to this date been at the culmination of such action. Its preamble states that, I quote, discrimination against any person on the basis of disability is a violation of the inherent dignity and worth of the human person. The declaration covers a number of demands, such as the recognition of sign language, the affirmation of the linguistic <laughs> identity of deaf community, the enabling of the development and the use of their creative, artistic and intellectual potential, not only for their own benefit, but also for the enrichment of society. Particularly relevant to the topic of today's meeting is Article 16, which begins with the following words. State parties shall take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social, educational and other measures to protect persons with disabilities, both within and outside home, from all, all forms of exploitation, violence and abuse. This convention can be seen as a symbolic antithesis or counteract of the aforementioned Nazi law. In the wake of this UN convention, the National Assembly of the Republic of Serbia has adopted the law on the use of sign language. It acknowledges this nonverbal language as a separate form of communication for people with no hearing ability. Eight years earlier, the, this law was adopted in Spain 
recognizing that sign languages as natural language, lengua natural in this country. Last, last year, International Sign Language Day was celebrated under the auspices of the United Nations for the first time as part of International Week of the Deaf, which falls on the last week of September, which is the week this meeting is being held as well. With the official adoption of the resolution of the 72nd General Assembly on December 2017, the United Nations declared September the 23rd, to say it was yesterday, the day recommemorating deaf people as a specific linguistic minority on a global level and urging governments to fulfill their legal obligations towards this community. It was at the Second World Congress held in Yugoslavia in 1955 at which um, that, that, is, that it was, it was uh, proposed that a decision be made to hold the International Day of the Deaf at the end of each September, a proposal which, as we have seen, has recently been verified by UN as well. This resolution designates sign language as natural and equal to spoken languages although structurally different from them, as an inter integral part of global linguistic pluralism to be nurtured and as a vital element for the development of person with this physical impairment. On the other hand, although the conditions for a more effective social inclusion of the members of this community have been provided at the legal normative level, the question remains to what extent will the obligation arising from the enacted legislation and the UN Convention be respected and applied in reality in Serbia. There still remains difficulties with implementation and enforcement of the officially adopted provisions. I don't know what is the situation in Spain. You as our guest from Madrid can tell us more about this, but in this country and not only here, there remains a problem of the insufficiently active participation of the group in question in the overall social and public life. Additional effort must be made to ensure that the contents of these documents do not remain just a dead letter on the paper. The two different realities, that of the hearing majority and that of the deaf minority, however mixed, are still unequal and they have still not become a singular or unique one. Their discrepancy, no matter how minimal, will always result in a degree of misunderstanding between them. In this sense, there is no act of pure or, or complete inclusion. There is no absolute inclusion. In absence, may, may be accentuated that the fact that once constituted as a group, as a true and international community, deaf individuals are no longer condemned condemned to the solitary suffering of a border and partly transcendent world which continues to be cruel, insensitive and cold to a considerable extent. So in this text, or rather this sketch, certain vectors of the position of the deaf, deaf are put forth in broad strokes. Uh, certain images capable of provoking a distressed reaction in the listener are presented. If certain things which are already well known uh, have been mentioned or repeated today, this was done with the rhetorical intent that uh, their strikingness serve as a reminder or, or a warning. So, thank you. That's what we want.